This is Bone Chillers to disturb your dreams. Dare to join us? Click subscribe. Ring the bell. But remember, we cannot guarantee your safety from the nightmares that await. Prepare to be thrilled, chilled, and filled with a sense of dread you'll find nowhere else. Welcome to the darkness. We've been waiting. The Roots of Pain In the heart of the Amazon rainforest, a group of archaeologists discovered an uncharted woodland, shrouded in an eerie silence that suppressed the usual cacophony of the jungle. At its center lay a circular clearing, surrounded by grotesque trees with gnarled roots burrowing into the earth like ancient serpents. Inside the clearing, a lone figure stood, an emaciated woman, her body and face cruelly entwined and pierced by living vines. Dr. Jennifer Grant, the group's leader, was the first to approach. As a seasoned archaeologist, she had seen countless wonders and horrors, but the sight of this tortured woman sent a cold shiver down her spine. Research into the region's history had spoken of an extinct tribe known as the Nanti. They worshipped a goddess of pain and pleasure, using the vines in bizarre rituals. The tribe believed that by intertwining their bodies with the sacred vines, they could achieve a semblance of immortality. The woman's condition seemed eerily similar. As the team ventured deeper into the woodland, their reality started to fracture. Visions of suffering and ecstasy bled into their minds. They saw the Nanti perform their agonizing rituals, heard their screams morph into laughter, and watched as the goddess, the vine-wrapped woman, accepted their pain and pleasure in equal measure. Their dreams were invaded with horrific scenes, driving them to the edge of insanity. Fear set in, but with it came an obsessive fascination. They had to understand the rituals, to pacify the entity that was tormenting them. Using the vines, they tried to replicate the ritual scene in their visions. The pain was unbearable, yet in those moments of agony, they felt a bizarre exhilaration. Every scream seemed to reach the ears of the vine-wrapped woman. Her glassy eyes showed flickers of life with each ritual, but their torment only intensified. After days of relentless trials and their sanity slipping, the team's linguist, Carter, had a breakthrough. He had been studying etchings found on a nearby monolith. They told a tale of a final ritual, a sacred dance performed at the peak of pain and pleasure. The tribe believed it to be the ultimate offering to their goddess. This, they realized, was their key to escape. Carter choreographed the dance with frantic desperation. They began the ritual, twining themselves with the thorny vines, their bodies screaming in pain. As the dance reached its crescendo, their agony transcended into a primal ecstasy. It felt as if their spirits intertwined with the vines, reaching out to the silent woman. Suddenly, the clearing vibrated with a hum, a primal melody that resonated with their heartbeats. The vine-wrapped woman, once a frozen statue of torment, moved. Her mouth opened, and a hauntingly beautiful song filled the air. It was a song of liberation, of pain turning into pleasure, of mortal lives dancing on the edge of immortality, and then, everything went silent. When they awoke, they found themselves on the edge of the woodland. The terrifying visions were gone, replaced with the peaceful sounds of the rainforest. They looked back to see the clearing receding, the trees swallowing it back into their wooden hearts. The woman was nowhere to be seen. Only the gnarled trees stood, their roots vanishing back into the earth. They never spoke of what transpired in the woodland. Each carried the memory, scarred and yet illuminated. They understood now that knowledge was both a blessing and a curse, for they had danced on the edge of pain and pleasure, on the boundary of life and death, and had come back carrying the roots of their pain. Even today, when they close their eyes, they could still hear the woman's liberating song echoing in their minds and the primal melody of the sacred woodland pulsating in their veins. And in their dreams, they dance, caught forever in the cycle of pain and pleasure, a reminder of the ancient woodland and the petrifying entity that guarded it. Mutation In the subterranean depths of a clandestine lab, nestled within an unmarked mountain, a team of scientists worked in secrecy. A meteor had landed in an isolated part of Siberia, bearing with it a novel, alien pathogen unlike anything ever encountered. They had named it XZ9. 
It was nothing less than a golden ticket to unprecedented scientific discovery. They'd chosen a test subject, a woman in a vegetative state. Ethically, it was murky territory, but the ends were thought to justify the means. Her name was Lena, and even in the depths of her coma, there was an inherent grace to her, a beauty that remained untouched. The introduction of the pathogen started benignly. Lena's skin took on an iridescent sheen, as if light refracted off a soap bubble. The staff was entranced by her ethereal glow, but as days turned into weeks, the transformation grew hideous. Her body began to twist and contort, muscles and bones rearranging themselves into an inhuman shape. Her face, though, remained as it was a paragon of serenity in a sea of grotesque mutation. As Lena transformed, the scientists observed an array of unprecedented phenomena. Rooms in the lab would spontaneously warp, gravity would waver, and time would behave in impossible ways. Instruments and organic matter began to meld, forming bizarre, biomechanical hybrids. It was as if reality was breaking down around them. Dr. Marcus, the project lead, deduced the terrifying truth. Lena wasn't merely undergoing physical transformation. Somehow, she was becoming a conduit, a bridge between our reality and an alien one. Morality, long suppressed under the weight of scientific curiosity, surged within the team. The lab technicians began questioning the ethical implications of their actions. Arguments erupted about the humanity of using Lena, the morality of bringing an alien reality to Earth. In the end, they agreed, Lena had to be euthanized. It was the humane choice for her and the only choice for Earth's safety. They rushed to the containment chamber, only to find the door unresponsive. Lena, now an amalgamation of flesh, bone, and a dark matter-like substance, seemed to control it. The room fluctuated between dimensions, walls pulsating like a living organism. Lena's serene face appeared on a large organic screen of sorts, her eyes flickering open for the first time in years. Only now, they glowed with an alien energy. Please, she said in an ethereal, distant voice. Do not be afraid. I am Lena. And I am more. Who is more? Asked Marcus, unable to hide his terror. We are the civilization from the stars, Lena replied. XZ9 was not a pathogen. It was a catalyst, a means to communicate. We have no desire for invasion, only for mutual learning, Marcus stammered, but, the mutations, are necessary adaptations. A compromise between our realities, Lena explained. Through this form, we can coexist, learn from each other. Fear not the unknown, embrace it. Yet fear was a formidable opponent. The lab crew argued fervently. Some saw an opportunity for untold advancement, while others feared the potential risk of alien influence. Trust was as alien to them as the extraterrestrial civilization reaching out through Lena. The stalemate was broken by an unexpected voice. We let it happen, said Iris, a young technician who had been mostly silent. Our curiosity, our ambition led us here. We can't just kill Lena. Not when she's part of something, miraculous. Silence fell. Marcus nodded reluctantly. Let's hope our trust isn't misplaced, he said, looking at Lena's face on the pulsating screen. As the weeks passed, Lena, or the entity she now was, upheld her promise. The lab became a nexus of unimagined scientific progress. Interstellar knowledge flowed, transforming their understanding of reality. Lena's grotesque form became a symbol of unity between two vastly different species. Yet, deep within, each scientist held a kernel of fear, an unsaid prayer that they had not signed a Faustian pact. After all, what horrors might the unknown still hold? The story of mutation had just begun. The Skin Garden In the quiet town of Meadowhaven, every house looked the same, except one. Harold's home, an aging bungalow, was distinguished by its curious backyard. Recently, he'd noticed a peculiar phenomenon. With every dawn, the sun's rays would stimulate the growth of grotesque, flesh-colored, bulbous entities in his backyard. These were not ordinary plants. They were covered with bluish veins, bulging eyes stared from their bodies, 
and their mouths were filled with needle-like teeth. They looked disturbingly humanoid and less of the plant kingdom. Harold called them his skin garden. Harold had first discovered the skin garden by accident. The first entity emerged from a small pumpkin patch. It had sprouted overnight, its grotesque features shimmering in the early morning sunlight. Since that day, they multiplied rapidly. The entities were harmless at first, unmoving, and silent. But soon, they started pulsating, their eyes tracking Harold as he moved. The monstrosities had become sentient, worried, Harold decided to burn the entities. He collected gasoline and set his garden ablaze, but the entities did not burn. Instead, they shrieked with high-pitched sounds that echoed through the small town, causing unease among the neighbors. The fire department rushed in, doused the fire, and Harold was warned. But the entities survived, their flesh had hardened, and they were growing bigger. One evening, Harold's neighbor, Mrs. Patterson, while returning from her evening walk, noticed an entity that had crawled over Harold's fence. It was on her path, its eyes glaring at her. Petrified, she dropped her walking stick and rushed back home. Word spread in the town, and panic ensued. Harold realized the horror he'd unwittingly unleashed. He had to act before these abominations overran Meadow Haven. He remembered an old botany book in his library, a book about rare and dangerous plants. Harold dusted off the old book and began to read. To his surprise, he found a chapter on flesh eaters, a dangerous plant species known to be carnivorous, their description eerily resembling his garden's entities. According to the book, the flesh eaters feared one thing, human blood. The reason remained unknown, but it was a discovery made by the ancients. Harold saw his chance. He decided to take the risk. He pricked his finger with a needle, letting drops of his blood fall into a glass of water. With a heavy heart, he poured the solution onto one of the entities. It shrieked, convulsed, and melted into a gooey substance, leaving a barren patch of land in its wake. This was the solution. But Harold knew his blood was not enough for the whole garden. Desperate, he called a town meeting, revealing his discovery to the startled townsfolk. Panic turned into reluctant agreement as they decided to donate their blood for Meadow Haven's safety. Harold was provided with enough blood to create a solution to water his garden. For the next few days, Harold watered his backyard with the blood solution. Each entity shrieked and melted away until none were left. The ordeal lasted a week, and each day the sun rose to lesser monstrosities. After a week of horror, the sun finally rose to a clean backyard. The grotesque entities were gone, leaving behind a clean slate for Harold to rebuild his garden. The townsfolk breathed a sigh of relief, their town was saved from the terror of the skin garden. Harold spent the rest of his days restoring his backyard, planting flowers and trees. He took great care to study each plant he brought into his garden, ensuring that the horror of the skin garden would never be repeated. Meadow Haven returned to its tranquil state but the tales of Harold's skin garden lived on, a chilling reminder of the horror that once grew in the heart of their town. Blood Symphony The echo of the post-apocalyptic city's desolation fell over the jagged skyline, each skyscraper more broken than the last. A cruel dusk crept in, as crimson as the constant droplets of blood that floated inside the hundreds of glass enclosures. Each enclosure held a woman, their raw emotions emanating as ethereal globules of blood. In the heart of this macabre metropolis, huddled within her own crystalline prison, sat a figure in drab black clothing, her skin pale against the bleak surroundings. Era had always been peculiar, with a keen eye for patterns and a sharp ear for melodies. The rising and falling of the blood droplets, her fellow prisoners' emotions manifest, had begun to draw a pattern in her mind. An eerie melody she couldn't shake. She watched and listened closely, a concentration etched on her weary face. She studied the crimson ballet for days, sleep-deprived, feeding her hunch. Slowly, a realization dawned upon her. The drops weren't random, they synchronized, oscillated in an arcane rhythm. The women's fear and anguish were singing a song. The blood symphony, was it possible? Could this be a relic from the world that was? 
A coded message from the rebels who fought against the regime that had cast the city into this chaos. Her heart pounded as the theory formed. With nothing to lose and the potential for liberation, Era devoted herself to deciphering the blood symphony. Days and nights blurred as the rhythms consumed her. She hummed and tapped, her slender fingers dancing on the glass as she found her way through the chorus of fear. The melody was intricate, enigmatic, as if designed to be understood by only the most discerning listener. Each woman's cage was a note, their emotional state the tone. Anger was a shrill whistle, fear a deep bass, sorrow a melodious alto, and hope, the rarest of them all, was a soft, euphoric tenor. Era found that she could influence the notes by changing the women's emotional states. A reassuring nod to the woman on her right, a comforting smile to the one on her left. Slowly, a harmony formed, Era spent days perfecting the rhythm, mapping the symphony. As the last note fell into place, she found a pattern. A sequence that matched the Morse code, a forgotten language known only to the rebels. Uprising at dawn. Set the blood symphony free, Era's heart clenched. The message was clear. They were meant to orchestrate an uprising. But how? She looked at the women around her. Hopeless. Beaten. But not broken. She had to set the blood symphony free. The morning of the uprising, Era felt a fresh wave of determination. As the first light of dawn seeped into the city, she began to conduct the most important symphony of her life. With gestures, looks, and whispers, she coaxed the women into forming the melody. The drops of blood resonated in the glass chambers, creating a hauntingly beautiful music that echoed throughout the city. The guards, unprepared for the defiant concert, fell into confusion. And then, the symphony hit its climax. The glass, responding to the powerful resonance, began to vibrate, the once sturdy structures trembling under the onslaught of the blood symphony. With a final, thunderous note, the enclosures shattered. Era, blooded but unbowed, rose from the shattered glass, her eyes reflecting the dawn's light. Around her, hundreds of women stood, their chains broken by the blood symphony. The guards, overwhelmed by the sight, scattered, their reign of terror ended by the very women they had sought to subdue. The Blood Symphony had sung its first and last performance. Era, the weary pale woman in drab black clothing, had become the conductor of their freedom. As dawn lit up the city, the once post-apocalyptic world began to hum with the promise of a new day. And there, in the heart of the metropolis, stood a woman, not a prisoner but a liberator, who had heard the song of fear and turned it into a melody of defiance. The Marionettes of Hollow House The foggy gloom of a late evening settled on the quiet town of Weeping Willows, its tendrils curling around the brooding silhouette of Hollow House. As the church bells tolled midnight, the spectral figure of a skeletal woman appeared at the threshold of the Victorian edifice. Draped in a black gown, her hollow eyes hidden under a lace top hat, she bore an eerie elegance. Inside, a solitary figure stood by a window, watching. His pale, gaunt face split into a toothy grin as he beckoned her inside. The only resident of Hollow House, little Alistair, had finally found a companion for his desolate existence. From her spectral fingers, an otherworldly power emanated. Furniture twitched and groaned under her influence as the old Victorian house stirred to her command. Tables turned into gnarled beasts, while armchairs transformed into hulking, grotesque figures. Even the chandeliers twisted into serpentine apparitions. To Alistair, however, these changes weren't horrifying. Instead, he marveled at the spectre's ability to breathe life into his loneliness. Each night, the town's peaceful slumber was punctuated by the woman's chilling laughter echoing from the house. The once benign home, now, was a nightmare incarnate, and the spectacle of its transformation had only just begun. Basking in Alistair's innocent delight, the spectral woman directed her new minions to venture into weeping willows. Hidden under the shroud of darkness, the transformed household objects began to prey on the unsuspecting townspeople. People were snatched from their homes, their screams muffled by the night symphony. Children, pets, Adults, no one was spared. Alistair, oblivious to the atrocities unfolding outside, reveled in his newfound companionship. 
his innocent heart considered the spectral woman his guardian, a benevolent entity bestowing him with fantastic friends. And with each new creature born from her dark magic, his loneliness faded further. The town of Weeping Willows, however, was unraveling into chaos. The townspeople lived in constant terror, their existence punctuated by disappearances and unexplained phenomena. Paranoia coursed through every home, every heart. Driven by desperation, the town's elder, Old Joe, decided to confront the evil lurking in Hollow House. Arming himself with a silver crucifix and the Bible, he approached the once cherished symbol of Weeping Willow's elegance. As he climbed the rickety stairs and pushed the massive oak door, a chill ran down his spine. The house was alive, aghast, he saw Alistair amidst the cavalcade of horrors, laughing and playing. He implored the boy to flee, but Alistair looked at him with confusion in his eyes. To him, the ghastly apparitions were but playmates, their grotesque appearance lost on his longing for companionship. Just then, the skeletal woman emerged, her hollow gaze sending shivers down old Joe's spine. With a cruel smile, she raised her hands. The furniture beasts charged, and the elder was swallowed by the dark, gnashing moors of the animated objects. The next day, as the sun rose over a town living in perpetual fear, Alistair awoke to a new creation of the spectral woman, an intricately carved marionette, an uncanny resemblance of old Joe. But, unlike the others, this puppet held a semblance of life, a spark of the person it used to be. An unsettling realization dawned on Alistair. The marionette's eyes held a familiar fear, a stark terror that reflected the truth. His guardian was not a friend, but a malevolent spirit preying on his loneliness. The charming spectre had turned Hollow House into a factory of horrors, a monstrous puppeteer pulling the strings of his secluded existence. The sound of her eerie laughter echoed once again, breaking the veil of his innocent perception. The spectral woman appeared, reaching out to him with her bony fingers. Alistair looked up at her, fear replacing his once joyous smile. This was not a game anymore, and he was but a pawn, the puppet in the macabre theatre of the marionettes of Hollow House. Thank you for watching, and remember the darkness awaits. Until our paths cross again, stay fearful and stay subscribed.